All right. So what we've been wanting to do, we've been mulling about this for a while, is um, have some process whereby to bring the, the constellation of practitioners who've been doing all the great work on the ground um, that links to what we want to see in wise democracy and, and co-intelligence, um, bring them together, starting really small, um, to, to learn from each other, to, to learn from Tom, to explore what does it mean to, to deepen into and, and move closer to that, that North Star um, or Pole Star of, of the, the wise democracy work. Um, I'm sure this could be described much better than I am doing right now, but I think basically what we're aiming for is a way for practitioners to share together, to learn from each other and from Tom, and also to do it in a, a fishbowl process so that others who are connected to this circle are, are able to, to learn from the interactions as well. Um, anything else? Thank you. Yeah, so this will be just that this will be an, an ongoing. Um, the date might change currently. It's Friday, uh, Fridays. Um, and, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to receive announcements whenever we do this, just let us know and we'll be happy to keep you on the core announcement list so that you can and it's a standalone, right? Like you can come to one, you can not come to another one. It's it's but it's it, it'll just be a, a regular offering that we will be doing. We could so. send you more information soon. As, so all right. So it's six after. And so with that, welcome, Ramin. Um, thank you for the framing, Jennifer. We are not going to do intros personal check-ins, et cetera, um, because we, we will have a chance for each of you to speak in, um, after Andy and Ramin have started, uh, sorry, after Andy and Martin have started there, not to put you on the spot there, Ramin, have started to offer their, um, their brief 10-minute presentation each. So the format is going to be that we're starting with short presentations. And then after that, you're all going to have a chance to offer any questions into the circle, any comments, anything you resonate with. Um, and we won't be answering those right away one by one. We'll be collecting them and then we'll be going back over to Andy and Martin for them to, again, speak a little bit in response to your questions, comments, requests for more, et cetera. And then um, we're going to be hearing from Tom, who's going to be offering uh, in the moment response. This is not planned ahead, but Tom is brilliant at looking at any situation and saying, well, here's where I see co-intelligence and where, here's where I see Here's where I see co-intelligence already happening, and here's where I see the possibility for more. So Tom is going to do his spiel, and then we're going to have another second participant go around. Um, and then we're going to end with a little bit more conversation this time between Tom, Andy, and Martin before we close. So that's our menu for the gathering. If you're all up for that, then we can uh, proceed. Oh, oh, one more thing. I do want to let you all know that we have a, um, and, oh, and you're welcome to use the chat for check-in. So if you want to say something about who you are and, and where you're calling from and uh, what drew you to this call and, and write that up in the chat, that would be great. Um, alternatively, we have prepared a Google Doc. And that Google Doc is open to everyone to, um, to link to. And so that's another place that you can say more about yourself and what brings you here. So does that seem like a, a good framework for starting? Are there any thumbs up in the house? <laughs> so, all right, great. All righty, so with that, uh, Martin, I will turn it over to you. 
Thank you, Rosa. Um, yeah, I'm glad people are popping up for lunch. So it seems a little more casual. <laughs> um, um, I just, but maybe I'll just give a little context. Um, um, there, the Climate Assembly in Austria um, was the first national public participation project um, in Austria, and it was paid by the government. There, I think the budget was totally 2 million and 800,000 was basically um, for the moderation team and our team, the film team. And um, my, my role was basically as a kind of a, what they call in art of hosting a harvester, you know, har kind of harvesting the fruits of the process. And um, why, because I had some, I have done some short videos about uh, the different Austrian type style um, assemblies. Um, then somehow I grew into it, organized the people who were on the film team and so forth. And uh, in Austria is very different than uh, the kind of other assemblies, um, especially the Irish assembly. And um, and I think I wanted, and also there there were different German national assemblies lately. And I always wanted to figure out how are we going to do it differently because the 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 team of this uh, the moderators facilitators basically many knew each other and they all count came out of the smallest state of Austria called Vorarlberg that's the most western state. And they also kind of make jokes about it because it's the farthest, farthest away from Vienna. That is the main capital and also where the whole government is. So uh, Vorarlberg is kind of running under the radar. And at one point they wanted to join Switzerland, but jo Switzerland didn't want, want them. So they uh, stayed as a state in Austria, um, just for you to know. And um, and, and Vorarlberg is also um, very interesting because it's not only innovative in this field, but also well known for its innovation in architecture and so forth. Some people say it's because of they have small classrooms, uh, because you only have 10 to maybe little 10 to 15 people in the pupils in the classroom and they say you can't hide you always have to show up in a certain degree so uh, so around Vorarlberg is a kind of uh, myth also um and and so forth but um getting to the assembly i think the important thing was for me what are what are the differences between um the german assembly or the irish assembly and what happened in austria because it was in that sense successful because um the people themselves and many of the facilitators and many watching they kind of um said this transformed everybody as part of it um and it was really interesting to see um how these citizens, uh, these were six weekends and they started uh, at Saturday noon and they left Sunday afternoon. So they were basically six weekends, one and one and a half days because the evenings were usually long on Saturday. And these, um, these about 85 people came together for these six weekends during the Corona times. And, um, and at first, they were kind of, as you know, people, they start the weekend and get to know each other and so forth. But these people, after two or three weekends, they gained such a self-confidence. And it was really amazing to see how these people, they were also had some media training, though, how they, the 16, 17-year-olds could speak in front of national cameras. or um, So you have the whole mix um, and they gained a really strong self-confidence. So for me, uh, one of the questions was, which I posed, uh, uh, I did an interview with uh, parts of the core team, core design team, and um, especially a woman who, um, from, who was part of the German, who's a German woman, a young woman who was also part of the German uh, assemblies. I wanted to hear from her, what were the differences? And she said there was one key difference, and uh, that difference was um, 
there was an, a certain core understanding in the design team, in this core team who created basically the, the whole uh, design was, we will, we will plan the process, you know, this is where we want to head to, but they will go moment for moment what is needed now. And I think the, 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 the thing is that certain processes can be really elegant technocratically in the sense you have these elegant processes and you try to move through these elegant designs. And, but they really try to um, move, through, uh, move through the design um, moment by moment, asking what is needed now, while also planning for the future, but always coming back to this moment. They didn't always succeed, of course, but it was always like this openness to learning or to be to what is needed now and not hanging on to a certain method or to a certain uh, process or to certain solutions or to certain results. So this, I think the whole thing is, uh, I think what I take away as a process as a whole is basically uh, moving through this process, being aware that you not to get sucked in into this performance pressure because that creates a certain anxiety. I think Brene Brown says perfection is uh, just a, a defense mechanism. So if you strive for perfection and performance, you kind of get into a kind of defense mechanism and you're not open to what is really needed now. You're kind of trying to push through things. So, um, and the other part, which I think maybe uh, one more point before I pass it to Andy, um, I think the other point, which um, uh, uh, sorry, now I just kind of lost it, but I think I'll just pass it on to Andy right now uh, for 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 my part and my and maybe just add thing after after um, Andy spoke. Yeah, that's. Oh, oh wait, it just came back. Uh, sorry, um, there was a system organization OE. Um, consultant as part of the core team and he was uh, maybe one of the lead facilitators he says if we uh, mirror as a team um, uh, what the what's going out in the larger group is mirrored by us in the team so if we really are careful and with each other and our differences and work through them and are open to whatever comes up uh, one person might say this is needed, another person might say this is needed, and they're kind of always in this process of being open to it and to whatever comes up, and, the, and that um, they call it in German, uh, Menschlichkeit, that's kind of the uh, vulnerability, vulnerable side of each of us, and if that's in the core group, it can be, uh, that can also happen in the larger group, so this kind of mirroring he says is like a, a systemic part of it. And I think that was maybe a part um, that um, can go under in large processes because you don't, don't forget this was the first one in Austria. You wanted to send different messages, um, how good this process is, how good the results is, and how good this is for democracy. So you you have to be really careful as process organizers not to want to perform in a way uh, to send on a very subtle level these kind of messages. So you have your own interests, your own agenda with the whole process. And that, I think, is a really tricky, tricky, tricky part uh, in regard to um, creating a process like that and being aware of your own agendas and what's, what's going on in the group. So with that, I'd like to pass to Andy. Yes, Martin, thank you. We will go to Andy in a moment. I just realized that I, I forgot to mention yeah. something in the framing, which is that um, I asked Martin and Andy to prepare answers to three questions. And I'm very happy being spontaneous, but just so that you all have a frame in how we're thinking of this, right? So the questions were, um, what do you think worked well? 
with regard to the Citizens Assembly in Austria. And we've just heard some wonderful contributions from Martin talking about how it, it really worked well to have this sense of what is needed in the moment, even though there was an overall plan, even though there was um, a, a over, ongoing overall planning, not just an overall plan, but and this, this focus on, on the moment. And then this thing about the consciousness that the people who are the participants, uh, who are the facilitators and designers and su su supporters that what happens in that team, whoops, can end up being a good mirror and influence on what's happening externally. We uh, call that technically in the trade parallel process. And it's a very, very, very powerful thing to be aware of. Um, so Andy, when we go to you, you are totally welcome to also speak about what went well. We also um, had this question of what would you do differently next time, which is an opportunity to offer some sense of, you know, what next steps would be. And then any learnings with regard uh, to the Citizens Assembly, e either personally or, I mean, e either overall or with, or with regard to your own particular role in it. So the, that's sort of the larger framing and you both are totally free to wander around within that however you would like. So yes, Andy, please. Yeah, so just very briefly, I was brought into the process by Martin because of my experience using Polis, this digital democracy platform, and with linking that to citizens assemblies and climate assemblies. Um, so I came on board, but I was not a German speaker and uh, so somewhat peripheral and Martin had a deeper understanding of all that. So just want to give that uh, framing at the beginning. Um, in general, I think what worked well was that it, uh, it, it happened, the group became very motivated and uh, even want to work after the assembly together um, to sort of lobby parliament and continue to, to push for change. So that's fantastic. I think the fact that it was quite innovative in using polis to reach out to the national uh, to to citizens nationally something quite new at a national scale for this kind of thing and uh, using uh, some elements of dynamic facilitation as well I think was quite innovative uh, I think it was a very well fleshed out process that enabled the um, the final recommendations to be quite detailed and quite precise. I think that was something that maybe is not as precise in other climate assemblies. So that's um, what worked well. I think um, also from sort of personal experience, fantastic learning experience, um, seeing how some of the principles that we work with, you know, wise democracy principles and using tools like Polis that are, you know, real sort of wise democracy tools, what it's like when you use that at scale, at a national scale, what are the challenges that come up? Quite unexpected things come up <laughs> that we didn't imagine. Um, we can talk about that maybe a bit later, but uh, yeah. And we had also front page news um, uh, in a national newspaper about the polis engagement, which was just amazing, you know, that, that we spark, you know, helping to spark that national conversation that went beyond the people in the assembly, I think was, was fantastic. Um, so anyway, what would I, what would we done uh, differently next time with regards to the, to the whole uh, climate Council. I mean, um, one thing that I want to say is that I think uh, we did this fantastic engagement with Polis, uh, and I have some, uh, I guess, yeah, yeah, slight disappointment that I don't think we used it as to its maximum uh, potential. Um, the, the results of the Polis engagement, Polis identifies clusters of opinion, and it showed two very clear clusters of opinion on all of the conversations that we ran. So we ran five conversations on different themes, like on energy, housing, uh, food and nutrition, uh, transport, things like that. And 
you know, each of these polis conversations with thousands of people engaging on them showed a quite a clear um, pattern of people being either quite pro these climate measures that are some of them quite radical measures and another group being much more sort of socially conservative saying you know don't really want to change um we don't really want to have austria as a global role model uh, we don't uh, don't need to be so um, urgent in in what we're doing so there was that tension that was clearly exposed by polis um, but it wasn't really, in my opinion, I, I, it, I would love there to be more conversation about that in the actual climate council that I didn't think there was enough time given to that. So, you know, I would have given more space and time to devoting to that conversation around the social tensions um, and maybe used, they used dynamic facilitation, maybe that could have been used to, you know, to, to look into those uh, elements. Um, so yeah, I, I think this is something that I observed in, and, and it's really difficult for me as well, because some of this may come across as criticism or everything. And I had this a little bit outsider role, so I didn't get to see and understand everything. But I, I feel in the Climate Council for Austria and in other climate assemblies, I feel there isn't enough attention given to everything that is reticent to change. There's a lot of, of focus on the science and the scientists and uh, how um, it's important for people to understand the reality of the science. I totally agree with that. And um, I think there's also a sort of an element of the human element, element of, of, of our reticence to live differently or our reticence to, to question our values and 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 so i would love to see more in climate assemblies of, of sort of welcoming in the parts of us that uh you know don't want change that we you know we want to keep our, <laughs> our, our our comforts and our and our things that may be challenged by changing our lifestyles to to a more climate friendly one so yeah those those that's i think for me that's one of the main areas there and and um things that I think could have been done differently personally in terms of how we presented polis you know if we could have gone back we would have done things differently like really sort of try to educate the team a little bit better it wasn't easy to educate the facilitators uh, and the, the publicity team on exactly what were the core qualities of polis and I think that came out a little bit in some difficulties in how it was set up um but that's there's a lot of sort of technicalities around that um and i don't know in, in terms of my learning i i i think what i've learned quite a lot is that the whole sort of citizens assemblies movement in general is moved forward by people from sort of progressive politics i think in general and I, I wonder how well they are able to embrace the more conservative thinking elements of society to really have that dialogue and really create uh, a, a sort of crucible where we can find common ground. Um, uh, uh, because I think at the moment, the emphasis is more about, well, the problem is that people don't understand the science and therefore we need to create a forum where we educate people on the science and then once they get it they'll be like yeah this is what we need to do but yeah i i don't think there's enough um holistic uh yeah embracing that the the holistic aspect of, of the different ways in which people have different attitudes and and trying to do that digging down from you know what are people's positions what are their interests and what are our core needs and getting to the core needs of of, of the differences uh, across uh, those different ways of thinking. I'm not sure if I've totally articulated that as well as I would like to, but uh, yeah, um, I think those are the main things. But in, in general, amazing experience, so much learning and fantastic working uh, in the team with Martin. And um, yeah, I'll hand it back over to everybody else.
Great. So um, the two of you now still have some time to respond to each other's uh, mini presentations, to add any more thoughts that you had have now about what you wanted to say initially about what went well, what you would do differently next time, and what you've learned. So, um, Martin? Yeah, I might, I might add maybe two method, 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 thing, method things. Um, as part of this, uh, I was part of the team in the initial design, we were writing the tender and um, and this and there was I th one thing that I brought in, but I think that was the team was very open for it is to create like an iterative cycle. So we just don't many of these climate assemblies are closed or assemblies are closed in the sense these people come together for a year or a half a year and then they deliver some recommendations. And part of the process was, how to open the conversation. That means during the process, you have some um, stakeholders come in, you have politicians come in, you have the public come in via polis. And that was basically, I think, I thought really very important, even though I think that could be uh, improved because the politicians and I think it was hard to get uh, get the politicians involved you know not just coming for an hour or two um, I think it, in the future what a, whatever is possible to get the politicians to be engaged more as part of the process I mean also work with the small groups so they really see them in action and the other and also that the people are uh, can eat lunch with these um, politicians, for example, and not just the politicians come in and then drive away again. I think that's a really, uh, how does this kind of relationship build? I thought, I think it was very transformative for many people because they were able to, they had like these uh, board of scientists, about 20 scientists, and there were at least five scientists on every, uh, every weekend there. And they, in the Saturday evenings, they usually sat with the scientists after dinner two hours and they went through certain topics. Also, they ate with the scientists and one of the scientists was uh, uh, received the Peace Nobel Prize and he was just part of the public uh, with, together with Al Gore at that time. He was a lead author for the IPCC. And, uh, and another thing that I think was really interesting as maybe a kind of an in innovation and I think a really big plus, there was no majority voting. Usually, in, I, as far as I saw in the UK Climate Assembly, the, <clears throat> the participants uh, elaborated different recommendations. And in the end, these 100 participants basically voted on each recommendation. And you could see... Uh, 80, 72% are for this majority, for this recommendations, and only the recommendations, I think, that had 60 or 70 and more percent majority, they came into the report. Here it was different in the sense that every recommendation uh, did not have any serious objection anymore. There was no majority voting. There was just every recommendation had to kind of pass through this threshold is there any serious objection left? If it was taken out of the list, and then uh, if there was still time on the fifth week and they reworked it, see if they could change, uh, work with the concerns, change the recommendation so it can go through the next process of um, um, basically reviewing in the whole group whether there's, there's any serious recommendation. So in the last weekend, on the last weekend, 96 of these recommendations, I think were 96, um, they had no serious objections. And the ones that still had objections, they were also listed, but they didn't make it into the main list. So I thought that was really uh, smart as part of the process. Yeah. Andy, do you want to, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that was a really interesting thing, wasn't it? I think they they had like, Different, there are, so there are different working groups that were working on each of the elements uh, or each of these different themes, and they had 
the experts on tap as well. So they had the, the scientists available. Um, they had discussions with the, the big stakeholders in society from business, from trade unions, from faith groups, from all kinds of uh, different sectors as well. And so they worked in the working groups and then um, they would have like what they called a marketplace, wasn't it? Where yeah. the, the, the different ideas as they progressed were put up on these big boards and people could just wander around and read them and then put their concerns next to each one and say what they felt was clear. This is great, you know, that which would, they had the, uh, some concerns around and that other things which they felt, oh, we need actually more information. Here we have some extra questions so that they could go back and ask uh, further questions from, from the experts. So yeah, I think, yeah, there was a lot of uh, really good thinking that went into it. And just sort of an impression that I had as well was for me, it's the first big public participation event that was run that I've seen work under art of hosting principles. And I could actually feel the difference there. There's a bit of a, a, a qualitative difference in the presence and the way with people, the, the way that the team worked together, at least, you know, it was less transactional and much more sort of a human friendly atmosphere that was created. So that was, that was really interesting. Maybe one more note to that. That was also in the reflection round. Uh, they the guy said, um, this, is, this hasn't got much to do with these smaller uh, uh, um, citizen councils in Vorarlberg. Um, he said, um, there, what's, what we have in common is like this basic attitude at the start is how do we make people feel safe? That was like a very core, pres that, like this, I'm not sure if you could call it hosting, but anyway, that was part of the um, art of hosting community is always how you make people feel safe and so they can really share everything. And I have maybe one learning for at the last part, I think in these, um, if uh, these processes are, um, have polit politicians involved, I just also, I was part of the first German assembly uh, um, I also made a short film about that. And I also noticed that was part of the learning that we didn't know that many politicians, when they come in these kind of meetings, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if there are many, but at least what I saw or understood is when they are part of a world cafe or part of the process, they kind of are kind of anxious because they ask themselves, can I sit to the group? You know, can I be part of it? And they have kind of a kind of a, because it's a total different setting. In many of the settings, the politicians have their defined roles. They come and sit on this panel, or they are a speaker, and they're usually attacked a lot. And this is like a, a different atmosphere, which politicians also have to get acquainted to. It's kind of a relationship building with the group, and that needs a little more time. And I think. Um, that I'm wondering how that could be improved in the future, but I think that I think that kind of relationship between an ordinary citizen and a decision maker or a politician uh, that that you can kind of meet at the at a common level, I think that is really tricky because of the role they have, uh, um, also. Um, polarization and so forth and so forth yeah so I think that's a really tricky subject and yeah I think yeah that's it okay thank can, you can, so can I have one one very yeah. short thing to that I think there's an interesting thing that was there also in terms of the politics there was a tension between the climate council the citizens climate council and the general politics going on around it as well so all throughout the process, there was some sort of some political parties that were less happy about the whole thing that said, oh, this is, you know, like this has been set up by a green politician and some were trying to discredit it. And even, you know, with the polis, we experienced difficulties because one of the political parties picked it apart and tried to, 
you know, uh, say it wasn't proper data protection and all this kind of difficult stuff that we, we then had with Polis as well. So there was that tension around the, the, the assembly as well that um, there, yeah, that, that it's not necessarily that there's this climate council happening and that the rest of the politicians were, were totally on board with it. Although at the end, I think there was quite a good acceptance across the board from the political parties. But yeah, just to mention that. Okay, thank you so much, Martin and Andy. You will actually have an opportunity to continue after we hear from participants. Uh, so now what we would like to do is uh, we're going to have a moment of silence in a moment because I want all of you to have time to, to think about this. But anything where you want to say, I really resonated with, you know, any appreciations, any questions for Martin or Andy, or any places where you're like, wow, I really want to hear more about X, Y, or Z. Again, this is not going to be ping pong. This is going to be a circle around. We're going to go around and hear from everyone. And... Um, I am going to time this. So it's going to be up to a minute and a half per person. Um, and uh, purpose of it is just because we want to, you know, hear more eventually from Andy and Martin and like that. And, um, and, and as participants, you also will have a second round later. Oh, and, and because we want to hear from Tom, right? Because so there's, there's a lot of different balls up in the air, but now it's your turn. And I'm going to, um, invite us to take a moment of silence so that you can all just kind of, I don't know if you have paper and pencil nearby, but just kind of take a moment and connect, collect your thoughts about what questions you wanna ask or what appreciations you wanna give or what curiosities you have. Okay, who would like to start us off? I'm, I'm willing to break the sound, so I'll, I'll go. Thank, thank you, Andy. Uh, th thank you, Martin. Very valuable uh, set of reflections. I'm curious about a few things. Um, and sorry, I had to duck out, so I hope this wasn't something you covered that I missed. The three lines to impact, I'm, I'm very curious about what you sense, and maybe this connects back to some of the political uh, tensions in relation to the assembly. Um, and it may be too early, but I'm, I'm very curious about the three lines and also from a process design perspective, how the assembly was intentionally trying to, uh, you know, ensure that this wasn't a report that was generated and lost. Um, the, in pol with the Polis piece in particular, I'm also curious to get a little bit deeper in terms of how it impacted the, the panel process itself and, and the final recommendations and any, again, through lines you see uh, about that. Um, and then finally, if you've got time, a magic wand, if, if you had unlimited budget, what would you have done um, on this process for it to have been even more potent? Thank you. Great questions, Ramin. Thank you so much for starting us off. I see Andy and Martin taking notes, and I'm sure we're all very interested to hear what their responses will be. Who would like to be the next person to follow Ramin in the round? Yes, Adeem. Uh, I'm curious to know uh, uh, Martin's remarks about engaging uh, the politicians uh, more effectively in, in the process. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you heard any or have any uh, thoughts 
uh, or notions about how to uh, how to do that <laughs> moving ahead. Because I, I just to say the experience that I've had locally here and through some uh, political connections we've had over the years have have been uh, very negative. Uh, there's a fear that I detect among the politicians uh, for admitting that they don't have the power to make the decisions or or uh, uh, to be judged uh, by uh, their participation in a way that uh, affects their uh, ability to uh, be reelected, I guess. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm wondering if, if uh, uh, as I said, if you had any, heard any suggestions or have any. Great, thank you so much, Adine. I'm sure that that's something that we're all gonna be very interested in hearing. Who would like to go next? I'll go next. Um, so there's one thing I picked up from Andy and one thing I picked up from Martin that is, I suppose, a part of an interest of mine. But so one aspect was around the nature of political discourse and how it can crash into these sort of processes. And um, and I think as facilitators, you're doing a real lot of heavy lifting because you're effectively trying to accelerate the personal development of individuals. That's how I see it because their emotional awareness and their maturity is at a stage that means that it's it can be really uh, difficult. It also crashes into, um, you know, I've been training a lot of Arnold Mindell's work around rank, power and privilege, is that for a politician to step into that space, there's what we'd call role ambiguity. And, and where there's acknowledged rank, there will always be a source of conflict. So, um, yeah. And on Andy's point about the marginalized voices, you know, can progressive people really be with some really like right wing views? And so, again, that points to, you know, our learning edges as people, as leaders, you know, what can you not be with? So then you create in the system these hot spots that will keep on recycling, whether they're out in the politician discourse, it will always come into these kind of processes. And so what is the training that's needed? Um, you know, who's going to who's going to commit in advance to saying we're going to help you grow, however you want to frame it and spin it <laughs> so that they can learn that they're hitting these edges. And that, that they're hitting these edges because we have to evolve as a society, because what we're doing clearly is not working. So so that's why I think people go to the science and go, oh, look, let me show you the rational reason. But there's the emotional edges, you know, spiritual and emotional edges that we keep on bashing against. So that's what. You know, and, and one biological point is our nervous systems are designed for immediate dangers, not those ones that are coming, you know, five years, 10 years hence. So we're always going to have this thing about, oh, let's show you more data. But it's like we're not designed that way to look. At. And that's why attending to the now is so powerful, because that's what we're designed to pick up. Thank you so much, Martha. Really, appreciate, oh, yeah. really appreciate your cogent. Uh, perspectives and, and questions and desire to hear more about the themes that you just raised. Um, yes, who would like to go next? I'll go next because I feel like my question might sort of relate to that really wonderful um, insight and, and question from Martha. And I'm curious about if you have any ideas or sense of possibility around continuing to support so people who participate in these processes continuing to support their whether involvement or grassroots ability to then go out and reach other citizens or reach other individuals and um continue to stay engaged or or have more um like maybe they they see another area in their communities or in their um you know, political areas that would really benefit from an experience like this um, and have ongoing support for that and also have ongoing sense of community with other people who have been through this process, um, sort of like uh, what Martha was talking about 
in the individual growth realm. So here you've just gone through this process, maybe you've hit your edges and what possibilities are there to continue to um, keep that alive for, for the people who have participated. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalia. So, oh, and can I say one more thing? And um, to continue to keep it alive for themselves, but also to be able to share it with others and bring it, um, bring that sense of possibility and uh, experimentation to other places and other people. Awesome. So, Laura, Tom, Nancy, Charles, and Sita are the ones who've not spoken yet. Any of you would like to pick up the baton? Um, yeah, just uh, thank you so much, um, Martin, in particular, for putting it together or um, just bringing it in to be a project. And I've been hearing about it. Um, and kudos, of course, to Andy and, and Martin both. Um, and so one thing I resonated especially with was, um, Martin, when you were sharing about this uh, tricky to meet in the common level because of the roles and polarization and I just thought that and, and the word culture came to mind so I offered that um, and just this tricky subject seemed like a special place to continue exploring um, so that's one thing and then uh, curious to hear any more about the process details especially around polis um, and that piece around the, the I think Andy referred to the lack of, com of communication or awareness around the tooling so what did they know, like the team and the admin and then beyond with the other stakeholders? So just curious to learn more about that. So thanks. Thank you so much, Charles. Who's up next? Yes, Sita. Hi, um, thanks for sharing. It was super interesting and um, grateful for all the artifacts also. And uh, I think that really helps to kind of get a, get a sense of what actually transpired. Um, Couple of questions I have. One very, I think, easy probably to answer. Um, you mentioned that in terms of the kind of disapproval or you know, if there were any objections, wondering what the threshold was for that, for that something to be removed then from the recommendation list. Um, was one. And then maybe broad more broadly, um, I'm curious about the actual process and in terms of how. Uh, inclusive it was in terms of um, different ways of processing information or thinking about um, neurodiversity and, and different kind of ways of engaging with learning um, and how, you know, what that looked like. Um, also thinking about the video, the presence of the video and what, how that impacted or didn't impact um, the trust and the, the space that was created you specifically mentioned around the politicians and their, I don't know if it was specific to this, but more broadly, you know, the reluctance to potentially kind of go there because there is sort of uh, uh, documentation or people watching and on record. So the impact of that. Um, and then also thinking, just curious about uh, related to some other questions, the scaffolding moving forward. So wondering more broadly about how these sorts of initiatives can get um, I don't know, discredited or, uh, you know, what the, the, the ways that the, the process itself is extended beyond the actual recommendation set and the documentation the artifact creation. So, you know, what happens next, I guess, and how is there, is there a model that supports that um, kind of a continuation of the work? Um, that's it. Thank you, Sita. Um, Next person. Yes, Nancy. First of all, it was just really, really enjoyed the presentation. Very insightful and stimulating. Um, just, I'm curious, what did happen with them, with the people after you mentioned that many of them did continue and whether there was any kind of support or Others have already asked this, but, and whether there was, what in particular was the impact of the recommendations? Where were they headed? What were the expectations ahead of time about them? Were those met? How were people brought in in the first place? On what basis? 
Was there any compensation for their time or expenses, et cetera? I was interested in the, the different methods and facilitation methods and how they connected together, having that kind of neatly mapped out. It sounded really interesting, the thought that had gone into that. Um, and then the, the question of how to involve people of differing views. Uh, and you had mentioned different uh, framing of the issues and perhaps labeling, uh, finding out what the shared needs are. Why would those who, who normally don't want to talk to each other talk to each other? Um, again, what would be their expectations or commitments that could go into that and the relationship building that would have to precede it? That was all. Thank you so much, Nancy. Laura. I was really interested in um, particularly what I was interested in hearing about the about the process and interested in what Andy was talking about, um, the resistance to actually uh, taking action. And I don't think that just exists in the people who reject the science and reject the information. Or, or reject the possible solutions. I, I think that even in me, you know, in people that I accept all that stuff, there's a, a big um, difference between what I believe we really need to do and what I'm doing. Um, and, and to me, that's um, regarding the climate, regarding a whole lot of things, that's uh, a huge question. So that's the thing that I resonated with the most. Thank you, Laura. Tom? Uh, let's see, am I? Do we I can have, hear you. Yeah, I'm on, okay. Hi. Yeah, well, I, in terms is of this, question. Yeah, this is not your co-intelligence 10 minutes. This is just right. your question. I've been developing the co-intelligence perspective as I listen. I am curious to have more details about what the uh, what was missing in the context around using polis. You know what what was uh, lost by the uh, absence of understanding by other players in the uh, organizing team, facilitation team, and what uh, what resulted. What was what was lost from that? What could have been done to to handle? that situation better, I'm curious. Check. Okay, well, Martin and Andy, before I turn it over to you, I just wanna say you've gotten a mountain of wonderful questions. Um, you, you're unlikely to have time to address all of them, but I wanna reassure everybody here that we not only have a recording, but that we are going to create a document with those questions and that maybe some of them, Andy and Martin might be able to send some responses in to afterwards. That's how whenever I teach, I usually extend the time by saying, I'm gonna answer some of your questions now and I'm gonna answer some of your questions later. So not trying to put you guys on the spot here, but just to say that um, actually the opposite, I'm just trying to help you relax and feel free about choosing which of these many wonderful questions you want to uh, respond to. Okay, so with that, over to you. You guys have about 15 minutes before we turn it over to Tom. You want to go first, Martin? You're, mu you're muted. OK, I'm just listening to myself. <laughs> OK, uh, I think I'll start, Andy, with a, a larger questions around impact and uh, selection criteria and so forth and maybe de more details in the um, design. Um, the, the, uh, also, just want to say that an English kind of documentary-like film will be out in a week or two, also with English subtitles. So you'll also have a feel of the people and what happened. Um, we'll uh, send you the link. Um, uh, yeah. Um, the the selection process was done by a government, I think it was a government agency called 
Austria statistics, right? And they cry, they kind of picked 100 people with age differences, gender differences, so uh, education differences, income uh, differences. I think those were the main and regional differences. So they that was the main, and that kind of replicated these uh, the mini that was kind of the mini Austria which replicated the larger Austria. That was kind of the main criteria. The problem was in the Corona times, they didn't take people who were not vaccinated. So that's why from these 100 people, uh, I think five were not or, or more were not vaccinated, so they couldn't come. So that was maybe one criteria because that's why we ended up with 85. But it was interesting to see um, that after the first weekend, most people decided to stay because some people just thought, oh, I'm going to just stay one weekend and then just check it out and then see if I'm going to stay or not. And um, I think the closeness to the society, to the scientists and the briefing of the society, of the scientists that helped them create the material in a way that it was understandable, uh, that created a relationship because many people see this stuff on YouTube and so forth, but hearing it live and then talk and hearing it and sitting next to the people who you, who's the scientist and seeing that person on a personal level that I think changes the picture that I thought was a huge dynamic into it um, and part of the I think the impact because uh, in July basically the results were handed over to, to politics the politics basically said the main person of the Green Party and another person of the more conservative party they said we're going to reach read each recommendation and you'll get feedback in fall and uh, in Austria, usually July, August, nothing happens. So uh, now in fall, uh, there probably the government will be start will be working on uh, on the recommendations. What they what, what are they going to cherry pick them? What are they going to do with the recommendations? That is still be is to be uh, is uh, to be seen. We have no idea if that is going to happen. For the other part, what happened to the people? The people created an association that means um, they all, after the assembly, they said, we want to uh, move on together because we want to see what's going to happen to the results. We want to create pressure, create impact, continue the impact, be available for the media and so forth and so forth. So they created an own uh, uh, organization, association on their own terms, a nonprofit kind of in Austria. And they are supported by two women who are financed by the European Climate Foundations. That is a foundation created by uh, an, many anonymous philanthropists who want to make, who want to get uh, move forward the whole climate issue. So they are supported by them with a website. Newsletters are going out. Um, uh, so there, and then they will. One person in the in the in the uh, in the participants uh, of the participants said, "Let's go to Brussels." So I think a third of them alone, or about thirty to forty people, will go now. I think it's in October. Will go for a week to Brussels, talk to members of the uh, European Parliament, see how laws are made there, because a lot of the laws aren't on just a national level in Austria, but also on a European level, they have to be changed. For example, how are goods transported and so forth and so forth. That's a European thing and not just an Austrian thing. So they said, we want to get educated what's happening on a European level. So a third of the whole group is gonna on their own terms and partially they're getting some money from foundations or partially there's some people who have a little more money in the group that will pay a little more and others will pay less. So there's kind of a, um, so they can make it happen. That's uh, another thing. So um, I think that's, that's the important part. Um, uh, and I think that's the continuing the support. Um, yeah. Um, Regarding the learning styles, um, I believe we, the group really tried to uh, include the different styles um, um, in the sense that there were um, 
different rounds. There were um, different interventions. There were time to talk about how is this impacting myself as a person. They had music. Uh, so they had graphic recording. I think there were many different, I think, um, I think that worked really well. Um, um, maybe I can say one more thing. Um, yes, Nancy, you asked about uh, they were compensated for each weekend. weekend. It was more symbolic. Um, even if uh, single uh, parents, they had also, I think they had some help also that they had a caretaker for the weekend who to, or a caregiver, uh, somebody who took care of the children. I think there was quite, quite a lot of organization around that. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, one more thing around the whole design and the objections. The whole design was based about um, around uh, like three things. What is clear? Where are dilemmas? And where do we have questions? Like there was a three-part flip chart. And the dilemmas were, where are, uh, if we do this, then that will happen. And uh, how can we avoid some side effects? So they worked through these three questions and, and then they had another uh, flip chart with four parts in it, four quadrants, and uh, what kind of needs and values does this support? That was one of the questions. Uh, what kind of side effects will it have, negative ones? What kind of positive ones will have? And there was another fourth. So they always worked th through these different categories throughout all the weekends. And then they had these so-called marketplaces. So these, uh, there were always two groups for one topic. Mobility, for example, had two groups or housing had two groups. So the groups could cross-examine these on these marketplaces what the others are kind of uh, elaborating. And then they could also give feedback and then the people would return and improve the recommendations and the scientists would look at them and give them feedback and then they would work on it. I think the, my part of the understanding of Polis had, had the impact that certain groups had the time to look at the, at the results, but it was basically the question, are we in the ballpark? And they noticed um, they are in the ballpark. A lot is supported. So they had a kind of, it, 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 it supported their momentum in moving forward. They did not take up, I, I'm not sure, I didn't hear that they actually took up some really, um, uh, some of the suggestions. I think the pressure and the time constraint was just too much for them to really look at new ideas and pick them up that was maybe uh, something that didn't really go well. Um, yeah, I think, I hope I got some of it. Yeah, I'll pass on to you. Sorry, taking so much time here. Not at all. Uh, yeah, that was really, really great questions. Um, uh, I think, um, yeah, I'll start off with a Dean's question where I liked a lot um, about you know, how do we engage the politicians more effectively? Because I think, I was present on the weekend where we had the polit where the politicians came in, and it was quite interesting because there was, um, yeah, they, they basically had groups and they had the politician in front and a whole row of seats with the uh, citizens facing them, and there was a kind of back and forth Q and A, and some of them were quite aggressive, you know, it's like, uh, you know, how comes you haven't done anything? It's terrible, you know. Um, so in a way it was replicating the similar dynamic we have in society of you know the politicians out there and the people and this sort of us versus them dynamic and just I think a simple solution for that is to have done it differently to have the politicians sitting around tables with them in a, I think the circle format you know reduces that us versus them um, tension and I've seen it myself when we've done things like um, in, in England, where we've done, had politicians sitting around the tables with the citizens, that it completely changes. But when you just organizing the chairs in a way that it puts people in front of each other like that, it does become more confrontational. So that's just one simple thing, you know? Um, yeah, so um, what else? 
Um, <clears throat> yeah, in terms of some of the details around what was missed um, when we, so we briefed the facilitation team quite late. So it was really literally the next day we were going to introduce Polis and the next day Polis was going to be introduced to the Climate Council and we had to brief the facilitators late on a Saturday evening. Everybody was tired. Um, and so, yeah, already it wasn't perfect in the way that a lot of the facilitators, I think, maybe didn't totally understand the, the value of Polis. And I think even with the publicity team, when it actually went out, there was this sort of feeling like we're asking Austrian society to comment on the Citizen Council's recommendations. So that was a small, that's just a small aspect of what Polis does. But, you know, we could have had just some kind of comments forum <laughs> that would have done that job. And um, so, yeah, there were just some basic misunderstandings really about how Polis identifies clusters, creates consensus, and some of the intricacies around it. Um, so that, um, yeah, it was, I think, in people in the in the organizing team, it was seen more as a feedback tool on what the citizens were putting out. And I think the citizens understood it like that too. And they were a little bit disappointed when polis happened. And like they said, oh, you know, I shared this with my, my friends and family, and they could hardly find our recommendations. They got lost in all the, the huge number, you know? So <laughs> so it was that, that there was a bit of frustration there from from the, the citizens in, in thinking they were going to have, the, the, the polis didn't correspond to what they expected either. So that was a bit of a, a disappointment. Yeah, and, and like Martin says, just not enough time to really look deeply into some of these things. I, I was just looking once again at the reports recently, and I came across one of the um, comments that was one of the most diverse the divisive comments uh, that you know that there was a lot of polarization around i think would have made fascinating discussion which was if i can find it or oh, which was i will not restrict consumption and that showed up as one of the most polarizing statements so there's obviously a lot of people that just to feel they do not want to restrict their consumption this to me something like that is a huge thing that needs to be talked about but there wasn't enough time so um yeah and also it's not easy to present the results of polis to uh, uh, uh an assembly because there's so much there to condense and so much for people to sort of absorb um what else um how we do for time um one last if, point if you could wrap up um, yeah but yeah okay um yeah, just want to say I, I really like Martha's points as well around, you know, what's the training that's needed. I think what we need is assemblies that engage, yeah, all of the parts of us, you know, the rational, the emotional, um, the artistic, you know, in, engage all of our ways of knowing. And, and um, I think there's more we can do in that realm too. So, yeah, that'll do. And maybe, Rosa, if I could add maybe a last thing. Uh, is that okay? Or is it yeah, just? Go for it. Um, I think process wise, there was a, a team, a public affairs team, they had a budget of about a half a million. And I think what one of the good jobs they did, especially in this tension politically, they connected to the mayors in the hometowns of the people. And these people were invited by the mayors, they also had some talks and so forth. And they also had these mayors from these different party backgrounds, especially in small towns, that kind of got involved in the whole media in supporting this. So I thought that was really well, because you could see from the lower towns, most of the mayors who were close to the citizens, the smaller the town, the more the mayors are closer to the citizens, they usually agree with this kind of participation. The higher you get on the political spectrum, the, the, the more controversial it gets. 
Uh, I think that was a very important part. And another thing um, as the design level, right on the first weekend, the participants themselves, they created a, an impact manifesto. What do they want to achieve and how do they want to get there? One of the feedbacks of the guys who said, you know, I usually had a boss and then the management and then the workers and, you know, always the boss says what's to do and the management kind of organizes it and we do it. Here, this was different. He kind of literally said, I never experienced that in this way. Uh, we said where we want to head to and how we want to head there to there to that. And then it was organized in that kind of way. And that kind of, uh, he said, I really uh, was impressed by that on this kind of level and scale. So, uh, and so I think that also set the stage for leveling uh, getting people in connection with each other, I thought it was um, really well done. And um, yes, I think I'll think I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Martin. So obviously, there's much, much, much more that uh, both of you could say. Um, and at this point, we are going to pass the baton over to Tom, who is going to share with us his perspectives on co-intelligence, both the co-intelligence that he sees happening in this, starting with that, and then where you see, Tom, that uh, more co-intelligence could be had uh, next time around. Yeah? Okay. I've been, I've discovered that what, what my responses to things want to be organized in terms of is mostly the wise democracy pattern language which is not, uh, not unusual. Uh, yeah, and there's so many patterns that kept wildly adding more and more patterns that are embodied and could be worked, uh, worked more. The general, the general uh, one that applies here, I think is the microcosm uh, uh, populations. This is an example of the citizen assembly, citizen council kind of thing uh is Tom, taking could you uh, say the name of the pattern one more time i didn't hear it clearly microcosms and populations thank you and if you could please hold up the card and show it to us so that it's on the i don't have that available okay i don't have a set cards available to me without a tremendous delay and okay. uh, i can put into the chat the uh, link to all the um, chung chung. Tom, I'll put the link into the chat. Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm here. Uh, to everyone. So this is the link. The list of patterns alphabetically, and each pattern is a uh, is a. Um, each pattern has a page. And what's in this? What's in this list? You can click on any pattern you're interested, and it'll take you to the page for that pattern. Uh, get back to my notes here. So part of what's going on. This is an example of the effort to take a microcosm of the population. Population, uh, and there was an effort beyond what is usually then to make a relationship between the microcosm and the population, largely through the polis. Uh, so there's many opportunities to expand that link. Uh, and the idea of having one of my ideas is to have lots of world cafes around uh, on issues such as the climate and having people from those cafes from the general population go to Paulus, put input of their ideas and thoughts uh, and that to be considered by the, um, many, the microcosm of the population and have that what they think fed back to the uh, to the population to have more conversations about. There's lots of feedback loops. There's a uh, uh, rich feedback dynamics is another pattern, and I sense both that there were some good feedback dynamics in this, uh, and particularly the interactive use of the marketplace generated internal feedback uh, systems within the uh, within the gathering. <clears throat> so there was a deepening of 
you know, the richness of understanding the complexity of the systems that was supported by the feedback going on on the marketplace. And again, that could be, there's lots of places that feedback dynamics could be made, made richer. Uh, the the uh, idea of the whole system and the conversation, there were many ways in which this, this did that. In terms of the whole community, a random selection of the whole community is one way to have whole system and conversation. The fact that you had the scientists there to talk to and the, that you had the you know, politicians and some stakeholders involved, but that's a, a this is boob, this moves beyond what many assemblies and councils do. Uh, and it could, it's an area that once it's named like that, there could be lots more to enrich, uh, enrich that kind of dynamic. And also another pattern is citizen stakeholder integration. Noting that the citizenry, the, the whole of the community as people hear, you know, one vote, one person, whatever, that kind of logic is the citizen-based sense of democracy. And then there's a stakeholder-based sense of democracy of the people who have a stake, who are going to be impacted, who have power, who have whatever in whatever the issue is. And they are the idea that people who have a stake in an issue should participate in making decisions about that issue is a whole other way of framing what democracy is. So taking those two different ways of accessing the whole of the system uh, and having them integrated in various ways. So I sensed in this, there were some, uh, some efforts to do that in small ways, but again, the sense that you, once you name citizen stakeholder integration as a desirable thing to work on, there's tremendous space to, uh, to do that, uh, to do more of that. Another important one that I saw here was, uh, was a pattern called context awareness. And part of the logic of context awareness is the understanding that context is a major factor. It's not just what's in the background. It's almost like context is a player, a major dynamic player within anything that's going on. So the politicians being in public conversations, the power and rank issues and all that are context for politicians showing up in a public conversation. And if you can't just stick the politicians in the public conversation, just so if you can't just stick a, you know, a single mother into the conversation, there's context around these people and you have to create a context that is amenable to them being able to participate. Uh, another, the idea of the physically facilitators in the public not understanding what's going on with Paulus, uh, the process that we, this is a big growing area for me and a number of us, we think, oh, this great process, we can imagine all the powers, and what great impact it's gonna have, et cetera. <clears throat> and then you're gonna put it into a specific context. Uh, and that context may have all sorts of resistances and incomprehensions and whatever, which make the process not unfold the way you thought. So awareness of the context uh, is important. And the social context of the issue, it's like climate as an issue, is a, there's a context of resistance, uh, resistance and accommodation and whatever going on in the larger society and needing to engage that as part of the conversation. If you if you don't attend to that, that's going to show up later on, making it a problem for whatever recommendations you come up with. So all of these are examples of recognizing context as a dynamic factor in the situation. Also, I noticed that my favorite pattern is using diversity and disturbance creatively. And that was present in many ways in what was being done and more, as Andy was pointing out, if you want to, uh, if you want to pull in the sources, the informational and human organizational, whatever sources of diversity and disturbance in the, comp in the, uh, <clears throat> in the climate issue, uh, you and having some process that can help you do that creatively rather than just getting stuck or conflicts blowing up or whatever. You need a container <clears throat> that will help you use the diversity and disturbance creatively. Uh, so I like both how it was handled and the prospect of so much more that could be done. And part of that creative use 
is all concerns addressed is another pattern. Well, it's actually the first pattern. Uh, and there was an effort to do that by moving away from majoritarianism. Uh, and I think of that as one of the most powerful interventions in any kind of bridging activity. If you can get people to express their concerns, you can go to what's underneath the concern, what are the needs, the values of whatever, what do people really want, what is motivating them, uh, and tweak things into shared understanding and deeper understandings down underneath people's positions and the things they're pushing for. There are usually, it's like nonviolent communication. You know, there's the emotional stuff that's underneath it and underneath that there's the needs. Other methods focus on interests, other methods focus on values, but there are drivers, deep drivers that often give you access to common ground between diverse people who have diverse strategies for getting their needs met or their interests taken care of. Uh, so there's work that can be done with diversity and disturbance to help it show up in a creative way. Uh, and another thing that I noticed I was impressed with is the, uh, the willingness to be flexible. The, the facilitation team was sort of um, exemplifying that. And the pattern that's relative related there is dancing with clarity, inquiry, and mystery. And I make a point in the description of the pattern that clarity is not certainty. Clarity is an aha. You know, you're getting, you go, oh, yes, this is how things fit together. But you don't then nail it down uh, because you're going to be open to something that may come along to challenge it and move into inquiry. And the inquiry will lead probably to some further clarity somewhere down the line. Uh, but it's a dance. There's a dance between clarity and inquiry, and all of it is aware that there is always more to it. <laughs> there's always more to it. Whatever you think you know, whatever you're seeing, there's more to it, and sort of have that assumption and the humility and curiosity that are um, operationalizing of that realization as you go, you're open, you look for whatever. So you're doing the clarity and inquiry dance with mystery as a basic. Uh, background. <clears throat> uh, and of course, generative interactions is another pattern, which was very present in all of it. And the one of the most problematic, interesting ones is enough time. What is enough time? Uh, too much time, people get bored, people just make space to fill, you know, make things to fill the time, but not having enough time for addressing a complex issue. <clears throat> and then organizing things so that the time can be used well. Generatively is a word. Generative directions is another pattern. So generative use of time. Uh, and so many multimedia engagement is another one. <clears throat> Multimodal intelligence, those were discussed at the end. Uh, Self-organization is another pattern. Felt agency is another one. The self-organization felt agency were dancing. The thing that was mentioned late in the discussion of the people having permission to kind of set their own priorities and move ahead in ways that felt right to them. That's supporting the self-organization and that uses their life energy. They're, what they're bringing forth, the, the, the motivations that they have for being involved in this at all, uh, if you give them the, the agency to manifest that together in the group, uh, that is tapping into, you know, well-utilized life energy, which is one of the other patterns. People bring life energy into it and you can design things that interfere with that or design things that move with and magnify that. Uh, I have about 10 more patterns, but I'm not sure I should keep Talking. Let me do a quick, uh, quick check. Iteration is another pattern. There were a number of things. Uh, the feedback between different audiences, the feedback between different processes, the idea that what we hear is not just an event. Ideally, it would be part of a larger process. And it was because there were citizens who demanded that this, that, that the parliament convene this. So that's the earlier part of the process and a later part of the process of participants who have 
organize themselves to, to care for this thing that they have created uh, and see that it's, that, it's, uh, uh, that it's carried forward. And I guess I'll close with a quick, and I think I'm either at or be a little beyond my thing, my time, right, Rosa? You're, you're getting close to it, go for it. Getting close, okay. Uh, that there's, there's something that's not specifically in the patterns but I have long, I have long noticed people who are in these citizen uh, deliberative dialogic uh, contexts where there's a sense that something might happen with what they're all that they're talking about. It's just, it's not all just talk, uh, and particularly the randomly selected ones where they can feel the identity of we the people. The identity of we the people is in the room because of how they were selected. It wasn't just left and right or whatever, black and white. It's they were selected at random. They are the people. They're representing the community, the country, whatever. And to have a sense of we're going to think this through, feel our way, and present our best thinking on behalf of the community, the voice of the whole the voice, the coherent voice of we the people, uh, the possibility of that uh, is, is something that is new in the public conversation. The idea of we the people is something that the left and the right and various people grab to say sort of our part of we the people is we the people. We the people are protesting the war. You know, We the people are taking over Congress to stop them from you know, doing the elections, whatever. It's like to have legitimate we the people. When you really look at a voice that is inclusive and thoughtful, that voice does not exist in the political discourse. So bringing it forth is a revolutionary act. But as it gains power, the powers that be will notice that this other voice, this other force in this culture and the democratic culture of political culture is gaining power and will take action to reduce that power to co-opt it to stop it whatever uh, and the idea that who is the most legitimate voice to a force to oversee the development the expansion development of citizen deliberations and that they're done well they're not screwed around with would be an association of people who participated because they're the closest we got to we the people on an ongoing basis. So I'm delighted to see these guys self-organizing, but they're self-organizing to push the outcomes of their thing. They're not going to the meta level of, we need to get this done more, more and higher quality and that they're gonna take action to do that. So that's just another thing that came to me listening to this. I was very excited to see them self-organizing. Check. Thank you, Tom. Okay. So you have all now, well, two things. First is I'm very glad we are recording this because that was a lot of very dense, wonderful riffing on the patterns. And two is that you are all now aware of what our stealth purpose for doing these talks in is that we have Tom on tape responding to a live situation with some wonderful insights. And three is I'm learning that I wish I had said this to all of you before Tom went on, which is that after Tom finishes, you will have your second participant go around where you'll have an opportunity to speak to what resonates for you, what are you learning, or what questions do you have. So um, given the time, I'm going to ask if uh, you might try and keep it to a minute because we do want to have a chance for tom to then respond like he you all just had the experience of when um andy and martin spoke earlier and then you guys had these awesome questions and then they went on and they responded to your questions so similarly now it would be wonderful for you all to have a chance to respond to what tom has said so far and then for tom and Andy and Martin to have um, a chance to respond a little bit before we wrap up. So minute, minute and a half, 
I, this is my least favorite part of facilitating is timing people. I'm just trying to help make sure that, you know, we uh, are able to end on time for those who need to. And then we will be keeping the Zoom ro room open for 30 minutes afterward for anybody who's able to stay. So with that, who would like to go first? I would. Nancy, go for it. I am so jazzed by the very last thing you said, Tom. I have always seen the Taiwanese revolution as a revolution of an entirely new kind. And I'm hearing what you're saying as a revolution of an entirely new kind. This idea of as people experience these things, they self-organize, they take responsibility for it. Because the question of how we scale up from the small, and that's the exciting thing, of course, about Paulus. But this notion that as different nodes develop, they start connecting with each other with this new sense of problem solving and power, et cetera. Anyhow, just clicked in place for me. So thank you very much. And the um, just quickly, I'm been given the chance, as some of you know, to develop this year-long course for UC Santa Cruz um, related to climate, et cetera. And I want to embed this throughout the whole thing. And so I really want to talk to Martha and others about what this the deeper skills that build on the patterns. What are the deeper skills and attitudes that students with an opportunity to immerse in this and work in their communities for one or two years could grow their sense of this is how democracy can work. Thank you so much, Nancy. Who would like to speak next? I'd like to speak because I need to go. Um, thank you, Tom, for that kind of that pattern level analysis. Um, what grabbed me was about the importance of context. And that relates back to some of Nancy's interest around, you know what are the deeper skills needed because otherwise we have this snapback or we have this sabotaging of these wonderful things that are emerging. And so how to really, and also language really matters because we're in a little privileged circle here about how we articulate things. You know, How do you kind of explain on a grassroots level what that looks like? So mapping the patterns to how people speak on the road, you know, in whatever community that you're in so that you can really track it. So there isn't this like people are grappling with, oh, what does that pattern mean? They kind of get it, you know, and that we can articulate examples that do relate directly to the patterns. That's a big chunk that's missing, the languaging for me. So there's no emotional connection or the person communicating it knows there's that bridge that needs to happen. And so, yeah, that that context of who's communicating those awareness of patterns so people don't keep on sinking into them. You know, history keeps on repeating itself because we're not paying enough attention to context and who's communicating the messages so that we can learn and transmit the wisdom. Thank you so much, Martha. And thank you for being here with us today. I'm just delighted you have so much to contribute and I look forward to having you join us again soon. All right. I'm gonna go off camera while I get ready to go out. So bye. <laughs> Awesome. Who would like to speak next? Yes, Ramin. Uh, I can jump in. Yeah, building on this through line of uh, we, we the people is something new. Um, again, maybe it's used rhetorically a lot, but this is altogether a different felt experience of we the people. I'm curious uh, to bridge that back to Andy and Martin and to get a sense of how much that was felt in the larger uh, national conversation in Austria. Did, uh, you know, because I get the sense that the representatives have that experience in the assembly process, but, you know, did, did this, is, this is altogether something new. This is a new way of thinking about addressing our complex issues and democracy broadly. How, how much of that did you see bubbling up that awareness? Great question, Ramin, and we will have a, a time after we go, uh, after we complete the round for Andy and Martin to speak to that. Awesome, who's next? You can jump in, I, um, just, oh. wow. it, it, was, it was great. And um, in particular, the transcript will be instrumental in, in sort of identifying the sequence of, of that rapid fire, Tom, so thank you. Um, 
so it just um what was coming to mind was was using the cards or even a digital version um in the process like somehow wondering um uh, I guess in particular, uh, Martin and Andy, in terms of you must have thought about that, or maybe you didn't have any moments to think about that, but, and also Tom, you know, just understanding more what was going on on the ground, integrating the cars, physical or otherwise, into the tool set at large, like what, and what were the maybe potential access or leverage points to, to try to do that. Thanks. Thanks so much, Charles. Jennifer, I'm realizing I'm not sure you spoke the last round. I was sitting here going through my little checklist going, ah, is there anything you would like to add at this point? I'm very much appreciating the conversation. So, okay, awesome. How Who about you, like Rosa? What? How about you, Rosa, as a participant? Um, that's okay. I'm going to pass for now, but thank you. Who would like to go next? I can share a thought or two. Uh, so good to be here. It's been a while since I've been plugged in to, to this crowd, so it's very uh, energizing for me. Um, when I see what's been happening with climate assemblies, I, I wonder if, wonder what the right sort of <clears throat> scope and topic is. And when I think about sort of even the conversation around language and how to reflect how people think about sort of coming together, how do we make this more of a, of a pull rather than a push? What are outcomes that come out of assemblies that are not just deliberation and opinions, but actually support people in some way, as far as dealing with the discontinuity that's gonna be happening around the immense changes related to climate change. You know, dealing with policy issues is important, but there's a, a, a buildup and a normalization of this type of approach that needs to happen. And how along the way are we intentionally designing these opportunities that support communities and coming together and supporting existing needs, you know, beyond just our interest in doing this more so that it becomes a, you know, upward spiral. So just some thoughts about sort of when is the right opportunity to use these, uh, this assembly approach. Awesome, Lauren. So what I'm hearing you say is that how do we combine assemblies with organizing, on the ground organizing? Yeah, and collective impact. And I know that some, it's a delicate line. <laughs> some, some want to be true to deliberation, but, you know, is deliberation all we need right now? Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Adine or Laura, do you, either of you have any, or Sita? Well, I'll, I'll just uh, say uh, throughout this whole conversation, I've, uh, uh, I kept getting uh, uh, re-stimulated on my uh, pet peeves about uh, uh, my uh, I don't know, going on 23 year experience, being involved with the Co-Intelligence Institute and its work. And uh, I, I, I noted down here uh, five specific uh, projects or uh, cases where I or, or we had opportunities to engage with uh, uh, the politicians uh in various uh, uh places and the one the one little story i'll just say briefly in uh, 2004 I, I was a state campaign uh, manager for the dennis kucinich uh campaign in oregon and uh, I, I i was uh, an advocate for uh, dialogue open dialogue processes of various kinds and I was invited to a meeting of the state uh, uh, campaign managers uh, with Dennis. And I was so excited to hear that uh, the state manager, the national managers that were organizing it, uh, had uh, committed to using a talking circle process and I thought, wow, this, that's going to be so great. Uh, but uh, considering <laughs> talking about context, uh, it, what it turned out was that uh, Dennis's idea of a talking circle was we all sat in a, a circle and Dennis talked. Oh, that's... So it, was, it was very deflating, <laughs> you yeah. might say. 
Uh, Sounds like a painful experience, Adine. Well, it's it, and it was my first, but uh, out of the five repeated in each of the subsequent five uh, opportunities and experiences that I've had. And uh, uh, that's why I was really curious to see how the uh, 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 Austrian uh, 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 process had uh, uh, engaged with uh, the local politicians uh, or Austrian uh, uh, national uh, uh, yes. political stuff. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so I do really want to have Tom and Martin and Andy have a chance to have the last word. And we have three people who haven't spoken yet, uh, Laura, Natalia, and Sita. So, um, yes, please, so, Laura. Yeah. So just quickly, the thing that Tom said that really struck me was that clarity is not the same as certainty. And with clarity, you continue with, um, inquiry. And I was thinking also about the problem with politicians is that people want certainty. They don't want wishy-washy. They don't want, you know, you to change your mind or to think about it or say, I don't know, or anything like that. And so I was just pulling those two things together. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sita or Natalia? I'm just enjoying everything. I don't have anything specific to add at this point. So just really appreciating everyone's reflections and great. Thank you so much, Natalia. Sita? Yeah, I'll just quickly echo, I, I mean, sort of plus one and Martha's um, language or comment around the, the translation of the words. And one of the real gifts for me of the pattern language is I look at that list and I feel like I've I deeply experienced all of those in different pieces of work I've done and so have a connection to them. Um, and as you were talking through, you know, the what you heard from about this uh, this event or series of events um, was a really interesting and nice way to sort of, I don't know, uh, frame some of the work that happened there um, and how it was curious, you know, thinking forward about future things where potentially the patterns or some translation of the patterns into a local or contextual um, language could be an interesting way to sort of sell, uh, because I suspect that in whatever words are the right words for individuals that many of those patterns are um, yeah, deeply felt and have been experienced by many people. So um, just appreciating that. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sita. Tom, would you like to take a few minutes to respond to any of these comments? And then we'll give Andy and Martin as Did well. Did Jennifer speak? I, I don't Jennifer, know. Jennifer, I asked her if she wanted to speak. Oh, is, sorry. Is there anything at this point, Jennifer? Um, the one thing that's coming up for me is this book, Saving Us by Catherine Hayhoe. And I feel like it addresses some of the things that Andy has been yes. seeing as a gap. And I'm just curious if Andy, if you know that book and just like what you know, what it would be to to bring in, you know, start from a different place. So probably to be continued at a different time, if you don't know the book. Can you just repeat the author? Yeah, I'll put it in the link in the chat. Thanks. Thank you, Jennifer. Tom, over to you. Uh, actually, I would just be talking more of what I was saying before. I'm uh, I was just listening to people instead of thinking of a response. So I'm happy to turn it over to Andy and Martin. Awesome. Also, I'm aware that I have to leave in about 10 minutes, a little few minutes early, so. Okay. All right, Andy and Martin, any thoughts in response to what's been shared? Okay, I'll, I, I'll go first then. I just want to first of all thank Rosa and Jennifer for putting this together. I, I've really, really enjoyed it, and um, I found it really useful. Uh, I don't know how it's like to be a, a listener and more of a sort of the the outside of the fishbowl, but uh, yeah, really, really helpful. And I think the thing for me, my learning here is. Um, it sort of relates to Rosa, your, your framing around, you know, celebrating and mourning. And I think listening to Tom 
reflect the process back in terms of the patterns and saying here we you know, here, this is one element that we can say is wise democracy, this is another, this is another, that it really helps me to celebrate so much of the process. And so often when I'm engaged in something like this, I'm looking at it, you know, how can we make it better? How, you know, oh, this didn't go quite like I'd imagined it. And my, my mind is <laughs> often focused on, you know, how to improve. And, and there's always going to be that, you know, that that there's, it's never going to be perfect. And there's always, uh, there's always more to it than that, as Tom says. So, um, yeah, I really appreciated this uh, to, to celebrate what happened, actually. Um, and it will help me in my in writing further on, on what I've done. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andy, for all of you who don't know, Andy is working on a case study about this. And Martin, as he said earlier, is working on a video about this. So we will be very happy to send you both of those materials once they are ready. Um, Martin, would you have any last thoughts, comments, additional? Muted. You're muted, man. Thank you. Um, uh, while Tom was talking, I had uh, some some story came up, which happened, I think, on the last weekend. Between the fifth and sixth weekend, one of the politicians of the Conservative Party, who also was part of the party which voted for the Climate Assembly, he said more or less, um, the results of the um, Climate Assembly are irrelevant. Uh, it's not legitimate, legitimate and so forth. And I thought it was really interesting because, um, and then the, in the early rounds of the of uh, of the last weekend, uh, one person said, hmm, "There was a question asked: Is there anything uh, in Germany you say uh, you have on your heart? That means is anything is something moving you?" And then one of the guys, uh, one person said, uh, one uh, participant, young participant, I think she just completed high school, said. Uh, the weekends were far too short. Uh, I wanted to also work in the other areas and other themes just as deeply as I worked in this one. So I'm kind of sad as this is last weekend. So what this was one of the comments from a young lady. And then, um, and then this older guy, a theologian, his name is Francis. He said, I was appalled by one of the um, comments of of a politician who said this is irrelevant from the conservative party and i think we should write an answer so it's also this this uh, i think it was very interesting working with disturbance on the one hand but also working with through feelings so the whole group i want us as a group to write an answer so they wrote an answer on in a news which got printed in a in a larger national newspaper uh, their answer to that and then it was really interesting to have a visitor of the conservative party there who was he was more on the state level and not on the national level and said you know i worked on this program with the minister federal minister on climate change and i'm from the conservative party but we in our state will take all recommendations really seriously because we had a state uh, council which influenced our um, uh, our um, public transportation policy. For example, in Salzburg, we have a free Friday. So on Friday, you can go on every public transportation in the state of Salzburg, and it's free. And uh, and we have a 365 euro ticket. That means one euro per day here in the state of Salzburg. That all came from uh, citizen council. So. I thought it was really interesting how that, how certain magic um, evolved. And I think, um, uh, yeah. So I just wanted to share that story also in the field of uh, working with disturbance, working through feelings, how that got carried out into the public. And I think, uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, as a final story. Thank you, Martin. What I'm hearing from your story is that 
um, the effects are different at different levels. And so one member of the Conservative Party might write the whole thing off and another member of the Conservative Party is there and really supporting what's going on, right? So it it isn't all one way or another. And uh, so the situation is still in flux and some people have found this very valuable and other people may still be resistant and we will we will see where where all this goes and how it ends up so there's a, a marvelous story to share um at the end i would love for us to um just acknowledge that this is i i, I want to thank all of you for being here uh and acknowledge that this has been our first and that we hope that there will be many more on different topics where we will have people come together as practitioners and then get Tom's wonderful insights uh, from the co-intelligence perspective and also have a chance for all the great questions from the people who come and um, in order to learn and participate and support and reflect on everything that we're learning. So for closing, I just want to give everybody a chance to, you know, do one of these three world three word close, closing statements. What are you leaving with? What are you taking with you from today's event? Okay, if I start, Rosa? Yes, that would be great, Andy. Well, uh, just three words come um, community, connection and learning awesome thank you so much andy grateful way forward oh, oops go ahead Please. nancy and then ramin C clear way forward clear way forward wow thank you ramin grateful community learning grateful community learning thank you real world examples real world examples yes gratitude tangible insight gratitude tangible insight awesome hopeful explorative process oh hopeful explorative process Yay. We can't hear you. I think you're saying something, Lawrence. Yes, I am. Welcome community inspiration. Welcome community inspiration. Yay. So good to have you with us. Hope you will show up to more of these. It'll be great to see you. Right. Yes. Family, friends, and clarity. Family, friends, and clarity. Thank you so much. Theory, practice, dancing. What, what? Theory, practice, dancing. Theory, practice, dancing. Ooh. Uh, Dean, you're muted. You're still muted. Ah, I was saying, Revived energy. Revived energy. Awesome. That's great. Calling once. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, only vaccinated included. Okay. Only <laughs> vaccinated included. Okay. Yes. Yes. That's enough. <laughs> Okay, um, going once, going twice. Anyone else have any three words? Yeah, um, dancing with clarity, inquiry, and mystery. Ah, dancing with clarity, inquiry, and mystery. Okay, Charles, did you? I think you said yours, yes? Okay, Sita? I said real world example. Real world, yeah, that's right. You said real world example. So I'm going to say thank you, thank you, and thank you. 
when we, a little logistical note, when we send out the video and the case study, we're also going to send out a little link if you feel so inclined to make a whatever size donation you wish to the Co-Intelligence Institute. It will be most appreciated. And if you are not able to do that, no worries. And um, spread the word. And uh, we, we will make sure to let you know when the next one of these is happening. And for those of you who are able to and who wish to do so, we will be staying on for the next 30 minutes. But this is now officially closed for anybody who needs to go. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much. This is great.